actual in the hallway. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so we're going we're going live with the hold frame. So that'll sit for four minutes now, but basically the YouTube link is live for guests, but you are not on screen yet. Julian, your um, long bio on the Giant Dwarf website made me laugh so much this afternoon. <laughs> I have Just not read it. <laughs> I have not included it. <laughs> good, good. That's the optimal but combination. It was very enjoyable. <laughs> I've just got a short one that mentions that you're a co-founder of Giant Dwarf, that people might know you from the Chaser and the Checkout, and that you're creative to the Checkout, um, and just that you've been at the forefront of Australian political comedy for years, and it's a pleasure to have you. Would you like anything else in there? No, that last one's a bit of a stretch, but not the pleasure to have me, but the other one. But, uh, but yeah, no, no, that's fine. So whatever you like. Too bad, it's in there. It'd be a bit more defamatory. <laughs> <laughs> No, because your long bias says that you're very successful in court. So <laughs> I should I should fact check that. Where's the link for the thing? The film? If you want to share it, Reese, it's in general, if that's useful. Sorry, I'm having dog trouble. They're totally going to bark on it. <laughs> Don't speak. All right, I think that we're live. Um, we might get started. My name is Tosca Lloyd and I'm the Director of the Media and Democracy Campaigns team here at Get Up. Um, it's really my great pleasure to welcome you all to our online film launch of The Cost Whistleblowers in Australia. We have people joining from all around the country tonight. Uh, we have panellists from around the country tonight. So it's very exciting to be here with you all online. Um, I'm going to start off by uh, respectfully acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're all joining today. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and recognise their sovereignty was never ceded. I also recognise those whose ongoing effort to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures will leave a lasting legacy for future elders and leaders. Um, tonight I'm on the land of the Darul people, which is where I grew up. Uh, Darul country reaches all the way from Botany Bay, uh, south of Sydney, all the way down to the Shoalhaven River past the Shoalhaven River, actually, and this meeting is being held on Aboriginal land across Australia. 
Um, if you know it, uh, please take a moment to acknowledge the people of the lands you're on. And if you don't uh, know the lands that you're on tonight, I encourage you to go away from, from this event and find out the beautiful lands you work, work and live on every day. Um, tonight, we're taking the time to explore and honour everyday people who are fighting for truth and justice, even when there is great cost for, to themselves. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge and respect that this is what First Nations people have been doing on these lands since the start of the colonial project. And the resistance and strength demonstrated by First Nations people across the country should remain of great inspiration to anyone fighting this fight. So let's remember that tonight and into the future because there can be no justice without First Nations, First Nations justice in Australia. I'm puffed because my dogs were just <laughs> barking before this went live and so I had to run and get them. So I'm sorry I'm puffed. <sighs> Bloody dogs. So this film, this film has been on the cards for about a year. Um, over 3,000 Get Up members, I'm sure some of you are here tonight, uh, chipped in to make it possible. And it's part of a much larger campaign about press freedom, open justice and the protection of whistleblowers. So many of you will remember uh, in 2019 when the AFP raided the offices of the ABC and journalists, um, it really sparked a renewed conversation in Australia about the role of the media in our democracy and why protecting it was so important. But from that campaign uh, that so many members, um, Get Up members were a part of, uh, emerged another campaign. And that was one about the people who make journalism possible, the people who make anti-corruption possible, who make our work at Get Up possible, and, and that's whistleblowers. And it's really not hyperbole to say uh, that under the Morrison government, a war was waged against whistleblowers. Witness K, Witness J, Bernard Killary. Now we have a new government, and while we've seen some promising first steps, we're looking down the barrel of some serious miscarriages of justice and threats to our democracy. Um, so I'm really excited to be releasing this film tonight. I'm sure you'll hear more about it uh, in the discussion. You'll definitely hear about it in the film, but there are two cases uh, facing the courts at the moment uh, of, of people who are facing criminal charges for speaking out, uh, for being a whistleblower. Uh, they're happening, one of them's happening right now. Um, and, and they're really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to whistleblower protections, uh, the broken laws that cover whistleblowers in this country um, and, and the immediate need for reform. Um, and you'll hear a lot more about that soon. Uh, but first, some housekeeping. So uh, I'm about to introduce our MC for the night who's waiting here patiently. <laughs> but um, I just want to say, unfortunately, because of the sheer number of people who RSVP'd, we're really not able to have a more interactive Zoom session today. Um, but, but there is a way to send in your questions. So we're going to open up a temporary text line. Um, and you can text into this number um, uh, with your questions. And uh, unfortunately, we want to get to all of them, but some of them um, we'll be able to answer tonight. Um, that text number will come up on the screen a little bit later. Uh, so have a pen and paper ready if uh, if you think you might want to uh, send in a question um, and, and, and we'll get them to the panellists. Uh, this discussion is also going to be recorded. Um, and the full film will be released tomorrow morning. You'll receive a link to watch it in your inboxes. Um, probably from me. <laughs> um, and so this film's power and impact is really simple. The more people who see it, uh, the better chance we have for change. And so we'll talk more about this later on, but please, please share this film. Um, okay, cool. Without further ado, uh, I'm going to leave you at this point and I'm going to hand you over to the very capable hands of our MC for the evening, Julian Morrow. Many of you uh, will know him for his work as part of the Chaser crew on ABC. Uh, he's co-founder of Giant Dwarf and creator of The Checkout. Um, and uh, Julian has been at the forefront of Australian political political comedy for many, many years. Um, I'm really, really excited that he has joined us here tonight. Um, and I might just hand over, over to you, Julian. Thanks very much, Tosca. Hello, everyone. Uh, and thanks in particular, Tosca, to you and everyone on the team who's created this fantastic documentary, which it is a great pleasure for me to be here tonight to MC. The launch of uh, one of the things I do, as you probably know, is work at the ABC as well. So while I've said it's a great pleasure, um, you know, at the ABC, we've got an obligation to be balanced. So I also have to say it's also not a great pleasure to be here. Um, uh, but I also do want to acknowledge that I'm here on Gadigal land and looking forward to seeing this fantastic uh, film. In the event that I'm unable to complete my duties as MC, uh, I've made sure that Scott Morrison's been sworn in as a secret MC. So we do have a backup if anything goes wrong. But the way this is going to roll is we'll roll the film 
we'll watch it and then afterwards we'll have a panel discussion and I'll introduce you to our panel guests after the video. We'll discuss amongst ourselves for a while but also you will see the text line coming up and we really do welcome your questions and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can in the session. That's all coming up of course but now the main event. Here it is, the cost whistleblowers in Australia. Enjoy. You're at work one day, you see something a bit strange, a bit unusual. And so maybe you raise it with your manager. Maybe you email your boss and you say, hey, this is a problem. I took it up to the most senior levels of management and I was told there is no other option for them. I was not willing to accept that as the final answer. It's dismissed, it's covered up and the truth is buried. Whatever might have happened to a whistleblower, nothing protects them from what happens to their life. Nothing protects them. It's not just a question of having lost that job, but really what do they do next and can they get another job? And in the worst case scenario, we know that sometimes public servants face prosecution. They face jail time for doing the right thing, for speaking up about wrongdoing within government. My legal fees are $3 million and they haven't finished. If you knew what you might face, would you take that on? My name's Jacinta O'Leary. I've um, been a nurse for 31 years now and a midwife for 13. Uh, I was the sole parent. I brought up my son on my own. Big family, lots of nieces and nephews. So I had a pretty busy life. It was 2017. Nauru was advertised being part of this Australian medical team. I didn't agree with offshore processing. I didn't agree with that policy. I didn't really feel like I could do anything about it. But what I thought I could do was be part of a medical team that could deliver good quality healthcare to the refugees. And I thought that would be um, a really significant and valuable contribution that I could make to their lives. So that's why I went. The Australian government is launching a video blitz aimed at discouraging asylum seekers from boarding boats bound for Australia. It follows the federal push to reopen Manus Island and Nauru. From now on, the asylum seeker who arrives in Australia by boat will have no chance of being settled in Australia. If you have a valid claim, you will not be resettled in Australia. You will never live in Australia. If you are found not to be a refugee, you will remain in this camp until you decide to go home. According to the government, by the end of 2015, 1,459 asylum seekers were being held offshore. These people, they don't think, uh, they don't care what happened to us. They care about only to punish us. Yeah, a lot of those people, um, the accommodation they were given was tents. That Some people were living in tents for five years. Tents that were mouldy, that offered little um, protection from the intense heat and the torrential rain. And that was their completely inadequate shelter. And it was, Really, really uncomfortable. <laughs> Nauru is the worst place I have ever seen. We just want to go to Australia and we want to make our future very bright. The Nauru hospital, there were cockroaches, mosquitoes, inadequate ventilation. I thought, oh, OK, I'll just work with what I've got. We'll do our best. But then um, I realised within a few weeks that uh, it was a farce of a health system. And when I got to Nauru, there were about 50 people on a list that needed to go to Australia for medical conditions that couldn't be treated, things like renal stones, things like, you know, chronic back pain, knee injuries, um, gynaecological problems, heart problems, blood pressure problems that just couldn't be managed. Um, and these people were just not moving. You know, a renal stone, a renal stone is like one of the most painful things that you could imagine. There was people there who'd had renal stones for over a year um, and had recurrent infections and terrible pain and they weren't being moved. And I just couldn't believe this was happening. People were deteriorating physically and mentally in front of my eyes. And um, that was an awful thing to witness. And the other people around me, other health professionals around me were just going with it. We're going, this is just a system. And I'm thinking, are you really, 
you're really accepting this. It's just such a difficult thing to reconcile. I, I, I couldn't work out what was happening for, for quite some time. Yeah, so I just sort of stayed in my room and went to work, yeah. After my first six weeks and I was going home, you know, I wasn't actually even sure I was going to come back because it was such a difficult place to work. And then I decided, yeah, I would come back for another six weeks. Um, but uh, I decided that, you know, I was really going to work hard for the refugees. I knew exactly what I was walking into and that um, I was going to work harder for them. I still didn't really realise then I was going to be a whistleblower. I just knew I was going to challenge the system that was there. Well, Mark, it was a special meeting of council with just one item on the agenda, the fate of its CEO, Sharon Kelsey. Outside the chamber, a tearful Sharon Kelsey hugs supporters and staff. Mayor Smith, who's being investigated by the Crime and Corruption Commission, wasn't present at the meeting. That was hard to watch. <laughs> You're just trying to do the right thing. And um, it's sometimes a very precarious road to travel and I think that just brings it home when I watch that. My name's Sharon Kelsey. I'm a, a barrister and a solicitor by profession. In 2017, I uh, took up the role with Logan City Council as the Chief Executive Officer. In Queensland, the local government is a significant business. A number of councils have budgets which are a billion dollars a year and they're very politically powerful. I went up to the council just prior to formally commencing and I met staff. That was the first time I became aware that there was inquiries into local government in Queensland, significant um, inquiries. When I first started, I wrote a personal letter to every single staff member. And part of that outlined the fact that issues like integrity were really central for how we were going to move forward as an organisation. So it was, was literally, um, I don't think it was day one, it was certainly day two, um, that people you know, started to make appointments with me. And uh, it didn't take long in the conversation before they would raise issues that had been concerning for them. And so I just found that there was this, this endless line of, of staff that wanted me to know the concerns that they had with the practices that had been occurring in council. What I was doing was really going back, double checking information. You know, that, that ran over a period, a build up of about a month or more. And so there was an increasing level of stress that went with that. But once you've formed the view, there's no going back. You've got to report it. October, I made a public interest disclosure to the council and to the Crime and Corruption Commission. Australia, over the past three decades, has gone from leader to laggard in the whistleblowing space. We began to have whistleblowing laws in the early 1990s in Queensland, coming out of a number of corruption scandals. Good afternoon and welcome to this special Bulletin of 10 News. Queensland's Corruption Commissioner, Tony Fitzgerald, has delivered a report which virtually upends the way this state has been administered. This uh, weighty document, the long-awaited report of the Fitzgerald Inquiry into Corruption. The, the Fitzgerald Inquiry in Queensland, Fitzgerald said, hey, we need to protect public servants who speak up. And we became the second nation in the world to enact standalone whistleblowing laws. And so then by the mid 2000s, pretty much every state and territory in Australia had whistleblowing laws. We then got whistleblowing laws for the private sector at a federal level in the Corporations Act. And then finally in 2013, we had the Public Interest Disclosure Act or the PID Act. There was a review built into it. That review said whistleblowers are suffering, the experience of whistleblowers under this law is not a happy one, and yet the law is still unchanged. So the Human Rights Law Centre has done research that looked at every single whistleblowing case in Australia ever. There's only been one case where someone received compensation under a whistleblowing law in Australia over the past three decades. The law enables whistleblowers to go public in certain situations, but those circumstances are so complicated, you've got to jump through all these hoops 
And if you don't quite jump through one of the hoops, then your protection falls away. The PID Act applies to people who work in the public sector and it's a different whistleblower protection regime than for people who work in the private sector, some of whom, but not all of whom, are covered by the protections under the Corporations Act. There were some revisions to the draft legislation at the last minute. The legislation confined whether a whistleblower was protected or not by reference to who they reported their concern to. It needs to be reported by an eligible whistleblower to an eligible recipient. And whereas that had been um, fairly broad before, the effect of the change was to limit it to a really, really narrow category of people. Senior managers of corporations being people who were effectively the CEO or had responsibility for 50% of the financial decision making in the organisation or board directors or a whistleblowing reporting officer. And the reality of that situation is that most ordinary employees don't have access to those people. And although, yes, technically they may have access to a whistleblowing reporting officer, that would require them, first of all, to think they were being a whistleblower, which in my experience was almost without exception, never the case. The effect of that meant that pretty much every whistleblower I'd ever acted for in my career would not be protected under the form of the legislation as it was now going to be. Logan City Council has been labelled the laughing stock of South East Queensland after sacking its CEO. I don't know why she was sacked. Um, the councillors have never really expressed to me why they don't like it. My employment was officially terminated, I think it was the 7th of February 2018. I believed I had reasonable grounds to challenge the decision. There is no real protection for whistleblowers. And so the only way that you can write things is to take action yourself. And so that's what I've done. Sit, sit. Um, so this is my family home. Um, my sister and I, we decided that if we pulled our resources, we might be able to restore the church. It's probably about 28 years since we bought the property. And this is one of the, the earlier plans to make it our forever home, just make it a place that we could welcome our, our family and hopefully one day grandchildren. This will be one of the key assets that I'll lose in pursuing justice through the court system. My legal fees are about $3 million and they, and they haven't finished. Now that's everything, you know, everything, as I said, my real assets um, have either been signed over, have been sold or are in the process of being sold. There's this secondary type of ramification. Previously, you were headhunted for roles. You find now that people aren't even returning your calls. You hear people say, we need people to, to speak out when they see things are, are wrong. We need that for our democracy. And so on the one hand, we're saying, we applaud you. On the other hand, we're saying, but we don't employ you. I've seen a uh a lot of difficult consequences for whistleblowers um, in the workplace. Uh, sadly, the reason people come to see an employment lawyer is often because they've lost their job. One difficult situation that I've seen for a lot of whistleblowers is actually being blacklisted in their profession. So it's not just a question of having lost that job, but really what do they do next and can they get another job? Um, then, as you can imagine, financial stress leads to all, all sorts of broader problems, marital and family breakdowns. Most of the whistleblowers that I've acted for have really suffered problems with their mental health as well. It is not that uncommon, I'm afraid to say, to um, be seeing whistleblowers who've been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. There's no doubt um, it has a, takes a terrible toll on your, your mental health an impact on myself, has an impact on my husband, 
Um, and of course, because we're a, we're a close-knit family, it has an impact on our children. Are we going to be able to live a life where, you know, it's full again in all of its senses? Um, or has that been taken away like permanently from us and are we just sort of going to live a narrower life? There's this sort of great looming issue that um, is zapping our energy and, and zapping our resources and zapping our time and somewhere we've got to find that space to live around the edge of it. In 2014, I was working as a midwife in northern Uganda. There were 100,000 South Sudanese refugees. Not once in Uganda did I hear anything detrimental about refugees. All they wanted to do was help them, which was just so different to the conversation around refugees that was happening in Australia at the time. When I got back from my second swing on Nauru, three women presented to me um, pregnant and they wanted terminations. The way terminations were usually handled was a process they went through and they were transferred to Australia for that procedure and then they were transferred back to Nauru. As I, I started to get go through the process, nothing was moving and then I was eventually told, oh, you know, no, they're not going. In the weeks previously, the government had uh, decided to just close that door and to say no woman was going to be transferred from Nauru to Australia for a termination. That's, that's not a reason to transfer her to Australia. Um, they didn't offer any other solution. They just decided to close that door. You can imagine this was pretty awful for the women. Having an unwanted pregnancy and having no way um, to access a termination, they were um, starting to self-harm and had plans for suicide and um, one had a plan for home abortion and um, their uh, self-harming was um, becoming more frequent and more severe. So I took my concerns to management and I said, look, someone's going to die. We need to find a solution for these people. And I was told this directive is coming from a ministerial level and that's not going to change. And so these women had better get used to the idea of continuing with their pregnancy and birthing on Nauru because there is no other option for them. I was not willing to accept that as the final answer. And I didn't really have a plan. I, you know, had never done anything like this before. Um, so I reached out to journalists. That's the first one that came out. Three pregnant refugees and nearly 50 others denied medical transfers from Nauru. It's about midday, one o'clock, four phone calls, one after the other. My line manager, the manager above her, the senior medical officer, they weren't saying it was me, but obviously they suspected it was me, but they had no proof. After speaking to the journalist, some awareness was raised, but nothing changed. All of these delays just played on the, the women's mental health so much. And so then I reached out to human rights lawyers. The National Justice Project took the case to the federal court and they won. The federal government was ordered to transfer these women for the care they needed. So it was a wonderful moment for them, and it was wonderful because I knew they weren't going to die then. And I knew that, you know, the self, they would stop self-harming, which they did. And I knew that they, their plans for suicide would stop. And, you know, so now they had an avenue in which they could get on with their lives. And so um, that was a wonderful thing. I know I was, I was suspected, I was being watched. So one time one of the managers came down with two other workers, all men, three men, just came in and searched my office. It's meant to be intimidating and it was. And you know, it did make me feel a bit paranoid and I was anxious. I just had to keep everything really tight. My computer was clean, my phone was clean. Before I went to Nauru, I had to sign a confidentiality agreement saying that I would not speak to media. By breaking that confidentiality agreement, I risked going to jail for two years. I had completely resolved that in myself, and if they wanted to put me in jail for two years, then go ahead. Yeah, I, I wasn't frightened of that. I got in touch with the human rights lawyer and I said, look, this is what I've done, what's going to happen to me? And um, they said, no, they're not going to touch you with a 10-foot barge pole. It would shine a light on exactly what they're trying to hide. So they're not going to, they're not going to touch you. And they haven't for five years. We know that too often those who speak up, including those who speak up publicly, lose their job, they face 
sector-wide blacklisting. And in the worst case scenario, we know that sometimes public servants face prosecution. They face jail time for doing the right thing, for speaking up about wrongdoing within government. In Australia, we've got two whistleblowers right now who are on trial for telling the truth. They are Richard Boyle and David McBride. Human rights advocates want the federal government to drop cases against Mr Boyle and military lawyer David McBride. The fact that these two men thought they were following a law that the government now admits is flawed. I brought the Public Interest Disclosure Act 2013 to the parliament. I was conscious then that we might not have got the scheme completely right. They built in this statutory review so they could fix it. And yet these two people face jail for trying to use what we now accept is a flawed law to speak up, speak up about serious allegations of wrongdoing, unethical conduct in the tax office and alleged war crimes in Afghanistan. And yet the people facing legal consequences, the people facing justice are not the perpetrators of the alleged wrongdoing, but the two men who told the truth, allegedly. We need our politicians to continue to demonstrate the importance of whistleblowing through reform, through internal changes. You know how to fix these things, we just need to do them. If you think about someone pushing a fire alarm when they see a fire, that is going to trigger a warning system that gets people out of the building and hopefully protects people's lives. What we're asking people to do is that when they see something that's gone wrong, to speak up. Now, if there's more risk in speaking up than the possibility of protection, people aren't going to speak up and we're all going to lose out. So I think the role that whistleblowers play is invaluable and, and really it's in all of our interests that people are encouraged to speak up rather than scared to. Whistleblowers matter because they expose wrongdoing and require us to confront it and to change. Whistleblowing is about the truth and the truth matters. They were just trying to hide, hide all these human rights abuses. And to a large extent, they did. You know, whistleblowers have come out, refugees have come out and told their stories, but um, there's so much more to be told. Do you like your job? Do you want it back? I love my job. Absolutely love my job. You're looking in on yourself, and um, I look at how resolute I was, and I think, that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed at all. When the pages of history are, are written for the final time in relation to it, I. I'm sure I will be on the, the right side of that history. In an environment where governments or companies are quite willing to have policies that do not uphold human rights, then yeah, whistleblowers are imperative and laws protecting whistleblowers are imperative. They need to be protected. have it the world premiere of the cost whistleblowers in australia free to view for all get up members and uh, viewers who are tuning in today although i suppose we should extend a particular thanks to the get up members for whom maybe this film wasn't free because they contributed financially to supporting uh, this film and making it possible. Uh, I'd also like to extend a particular congratulations and thanks to the filmmaker of The Cost, Shay Natelovich. It's a fantastic piece of work um, and I hope and I'm sure that it's got everyone who's viewing passionate about the cause of better protection for whistleblowers, although uh, I suspect it hasn't got people particularly enthusiastic about the idea of actually queuing up to blow the whistle themselves, because it is a, uh, a traumatic and challenging experience. And on that note, before we uh, 
st- go into the discussion, I did want to acknowledge that I, I believe that Sharon Kelsey, uh, who was in the documentary, is viewing the premiere today. Um, I'm not sure if Jacinta O'Leary is online as well, but before we go any further, I did want to uh, acknowledge and the the courage, the persistence and the resilience of Sharon and of Jacinta and of um, any whistleblower who goes through the full process in the way that uh, Sharon has. Um, I'm really interested in this area because way back in ancient history, I I used to be an employment lawyer by day. I used to work on the the chaser by night. I was sort of a defamation practitioner by night and an employment lawyer by day. And I know that it's very difficult for employees who find themselves in challenging situations like this and that the laws that we have in Australia, uh, while better than many places, do not do what they should do to protect people with the uh, the courage to stand up for what they believe in and for what is right. So we're going to head now into our panel discussion. Uh, just a reminder that you can text in your questions and we will include those in the discussion um, after we have a bit of a chat amongst the panel uh, ourselves. But now it's my very great pleasure to introduce our panellists today and I'll do it one by one so that we say hello to everyone before we kick things off. And of course, we start with uh, Larissa Baldwin, the CEO of of get up freshly minted in that role g'day larissa welcome to the chat where are you coming to us from today i'm on gadigal country um in sydney fantastic um and um i'll come back to you in a second larissa but um presumably very very um very very smooth ship being sailed in, with the new uh new captain at the helm well, we hope so <laughs> Excellent. Well, we'll come back to you shortly, uh, Larissa. I'd also uh, like to welcome Samantha Manguana, who we saw in the video, who is the head of employment law at Shine Lawyers. G'day, Samantha. Hi there. Great to have you. Um, have you been? Uh, is your inbox flowing up already with uh, whistleblowers wanting to blow the whistle after hearing about the experiences in that documentary? Um, not, not quite yet. But I not think quite yet. Right, but they will but, come. Um, it is a sobering film to watch. It is indeed. It is indeed. Thanks, Sam. And I'd also like to introduce and welcome Kieran Pender, another star of The Cost, who's a senior lawyer in the Democratic Freedoms team at the Human Rights Law Centre. Now, that is a great job title. There were no job titles like that in any of the law firms I worked in. Welcome, Kieran Pender. Thanks, Julian. And a fantastic and, as Samantha said, really sobering film we've just watched and looking forward to reflecting on it. Great. Well, um, I'll kick the discussion off by coming back to you, uh, Larissa. We heard a little bit uh, earlier about the uh, the democracy and whistleblowing campaign that GetUp's been running, but could you just tell us a little bit more about why GetUp made this documentary and the broader context of the democracy and um, press freedom campaigns that GetUp is running? Yeah, I, absolutely. At the heart of GetUp's uh, press freedom campaign is the fight for stronger whistleblower protection. So, you know, you might have heard when in 2019 the AFP raided ABC offices and homes of journalists, our GetUp members always are, are willing to spring to action, funding research, engaging, engaging in the inquiries and lots and lots of lobbying in the halls of parliament. So for years we pushed back against a culture of growing secrecy and silencing uh, that's been pursued by Mo- the Morrison government. Um, putting journalists and their sources at risk, but also our democracy uh, and the ability to know the truth. So this has been highlighted by the prosecutions of Bernard uh, Caleri and Richard Boyle, an ATO whistleblower, and David McBride. Um, I think that the film also just points out, like, these people are regular people. They're people like me and you who want to stand up when they see something that's wrong. Um, And it is within our public interest and our best interest and interest of our democracy. So... Since the uh, 2020 election, uh, the campaign has only deepened. We have changed government uh, and it has changed the, uh, you know, we talk about as campaigners, it's kind of the overton window, but what is possible? Uh, we now have Mark Draspis, who was um, instrumental into, into implementing the uh, Public uh, Interest Disclosure Act. And he understands that, uh, first of all, he came in and he understands what's happening across the country and the fact that people really think that these whistleblowers should be protected. Um, so he uh, intervened in the case of Bernard Caleri, a uh, witness case lawyer, had that persecution dropped. Um, but he also has doubled down and said that his assessment is that Australia's whistleblowing laws are broken and they need reform. Despite this, there are two men who are still fighting um, and Richard Boyle is before the courts now. He's facing something like 161 years uh, in prison uh, for for 
um, saying things that are within our interests. And he's now arguing for protection under the Public Interest Disclosure Act. Um, and David McBride is going to um, intervene. Um, David McBride is going to face court in the coming months as well. So there are lots of things that whistleblowers face. And we're talking about the crippling debt, um, wrongful dismissal, the blacklisting, the complete lack of support from the laws and government for, um, for speaking out. It is up to us as a movement, and the Get Up movement uh, was started off the back of a Saviour ABC campaign. We, we believe in a free press and what it offers us. Um, but this is what we're trying to do now is make the country understand that right now, don't just trust the government are going to do this. Yes, they've gone a certain part of the way to say that we will have a national anti-corruption commission, but at the same time, there's no protection for whistleblowers, and that is something that's really instrumental. And it's very possible right now for us to win this. Uh, the government is looking and reviewing these laws, uh, and they need to see the public pressure and the public interest um, and people saying that we need them right now. And so that is the thing that's actually going to push Dreyfus into moving it and making these things viable. Mm, yeah, it really is a unique moment. It's perhaps a rare thing to have an Attorney General who introduced this law when he was last in the role, but who is willing to acknowledge that there are problems with this law and that uh, they should be addressed. We might talk a little bit about when and how they might be addressed, but in particular also those um, prosecutions that you referred to, it is absolutely critical that those prosecutions get as much uh, attention and coverage and that people make their views known about what's happening to these uh, two whistleblowers. And perhaps I can bring uh, you in on that part of the conversation, Kieran Pender. Could you just tell us a little bit more about the cases against the ATO whistleblower, Richard Boyle, and also um, David McBride? And just that, I mean, that, that staggering observation that you have in the film that of all the wrongdoing that occurred by uh, Australian service people with war crimes that's now been um, acknowledged even by the Australian military's internal review. The only person who's been charged with a criminal offence in relation to that is David McBride. It's just just staggering. Uh, uh, certainly a staggering fact, uh, deeply alarming. I think speaks to this wider challenge we face in Australia right now with the, the war on, on whistleblowers. Uh, we have actually, you know, as we speak today and for the past week, Richard Boyle, the tax office whistleblower, he exposed what he saw as wrongdoing, unethical conduct, aggressive debt recovery against small businesses, a, a lack of compassion, uh, a, a sort of a culture that was dismissive of taxpayers, um, raising real concerns about uh, debts that had been accrued against them that potentially didn't exist and were having significant impact on their mental health. Uh, he blew the whistle on that. That's led to change. It's led to change in the way uh, these issues are dealt with. There have been three independent inquiries from the tax ombudsman, from the small business and family enterprise ombudsman, and from the Senate. All three of them have vindicated him. And yet last week, he became the first whistleblower on trial, trying to defend his prosecution on the basis of a whistleblowing law. An unjust prosecution and a prosecution that's not in the public interest. Similarly, the McBride case, as you mentioned, David McBride is alleged to have blown the whistle internally to the police and ultimately to the ABC in relation to allegations of war crimes committed by Australian forces, allegedly, in Afghanistan. He goes on trial in a couple of weeks' time. Two cases where the whistleblowers thought they were doing the right thing. They thought they were following whistleblowing law. The Public Interest Disclosure Act allows whistleblowers to speak up via the media if their attempts to speak up internally first have failed. So they thought what they were doing was lawful and now they face prosecution. Both cases that are not in the public interest and the Attorney General Mark Dreyfus can drop them at any time. As he indicated in the Caleri case, where he did the right thing and dropped that prosecution, he can do the same in these two other cases, and then he can get on with the job of fixing our whistleblowing laws. Kieran, in terms of the arguments that Richard Boyle and David McBride are running, um, obviously it'll be determined by the court. You can't, you don't have a crystal ball. But uh, do you think that the the, the PID Act in its current flawed form uh, is potentially a significant weapon that might uh, protect uh, Richard Boyle and David McBride, even though just going through the prosecution is, you know, a terrible thing in itself? Yeah, uh, these are historic test cases. The first time, first and second time that Australia's whistleblowing law has been tested in this way. Uh, of course, it is possible and, and from my perspective, desirable that they are successful. So the whistleblowing law says if you blow the whistle in this way, you're immune from criminal prosecution. It would be very much a good thing for Australian democracy if those cases succeed and they never face trial before a jury. 
But whatever happens, if they win, it will be a pyrrhic victory. Both of them have wasted years of their life fighting this unjust prosecution. They've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on legal fees. Uh, Their mental health, both have spoken openly about the mental health impact of these prosecutions. And then, of course, if they're unsuccessful, and particularly if they're unsuccessful, they may well appeal. But if ultimately they're unsuccessful, they will then face a jury and ultimately face the prospect of jail time if they are convicted of these crimes. And again, I think it's worth remembering, what are they on trial for? Fundamentally, they're on trial for telling the truth. Both of them are alleged to have spoken up about wrongdoing, government wrongdoing, wrongdoing that's been vindicated. Changes have occurred as a result of their whistleblowing, and yet they are the ones on trial. That is not good for our democracy. Yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, they do say sometimes that the uh, the process is the punishment, but in both those cases, there's a very real punishment sitting at the end of the process as well. And so it's a uh, uh, an extraordinarily serious and critical moment um, for uh, anyone who believes in the protection of, of whistleblowers. Uh, Sam Manguana, I was interested to hear in the documentary about the protections for whistleblowers in the private sector, I must admit, I wasn't as aware of that. Um, how often do, do uh, whistles get blown in the private sector and, and, and how effective have those uh, still flawed but nevertheless existing Corporations Act protections been in your view? Um, it's a great question. Um, uh, the whistle gets blown in the private sector all the time, just, just as much as it does in the public sector. Um, and if I think back uh, through my career, uh, which started in the UK, um, going back to 2005, I was working on whistleblowing cases in the private sector. And there'd be a whole range of different examples, things like in financial services, compliance issues, um, trades being flagged as um, outside of regulatory conduct um, in the health sector where um, practices were putting patients' healthcare lives at risk. Um, In media, uh, sometimes it was about calling out cultures of sexual harassment Um, also issues in catering and fast food to do with um, food hygiene and the conditions that meat was kept in. So, I mean, it could be literally anything in in any sphere. Um, The issue with the private sector protections is uh, it's complicated in the sense that in many, many respects, they're they're fantastic laws and um, address a lot of the problems with with the, that I was familiar with, with the UK legislation. Um, There's there's really powerful sanctions. There's a reverse onus proof. Um, So they're very creative and there's there's even cost protection for, for whistleblowers. But the chief problem with them, in my perspective, from my perspective, is that they unfortunately do not cover many people for for the simple reason that when someone first raises their concern, they tend to raise it to a colleague, perhaps a a supervisor, Um, but they don't raise it to these narrow categories of um, eligible whistleblowers, which gains them the protection of the law. So effectively, they're going they're flying without the protection of the law in in this these scenarios which means that whatever um repercussions whatever retaliation they suffer the the current legislation doesn't actually protect them Mm, yeah it's interesting and 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 kieran i think said that uh... the laws are so complex that you know if you don't jump through the right uh hoop the, the the protections fall away although at the same time i think it was um, Jacinta, who said something like, oh, I didn't sort of realise I was being uh, a whistleblower when it happens. It's, and I think you said as well that that happens quite a lot. How could you, um, if there are all these particular um, hoops that you have to jump through, how could you be a whistleblower and be potentially protected by the Public Interest Disclosures Act without knowing it? So, so that's a real challenge because what tends to happen, certainly in the cases I see, people come to me because something's gone wrong at work, they've lost their job or, or they're facing retaliation of some sort. And then we work backwards through what happened. They've reported something that would be covered 
um, by the whistleblowing legislation in terms of its substance. But because of the person that they reported it to, the legislation doesn't actually protect them. Um, Mm. And so we're actually looking at at, a different possible um, remedies, which which is a frustration because in many ways this legislation is really well designed, um, but then it's not actually protecting the people who who we want to speak out in our interests. Mm. Uh, but Kieran, I think it's right, isn't it, that in the in, in the public sector at least, you can actually make a public interest disclosure without realising you are. Yeah. So the law applies whether or not you know you're making it, uh, and the the public sector law doesn't have that same flaw that Sam's pointed out in the private sector. Unfortunately, it has many, many other flaws. So the, the Public Interest Disclosure Act, which covers federal public service blowers, it was enacted in 2013 by Mark Dreyfus when he was then Attorney General. He's now back and nothing has changed. There was a review built into the Act that happened in 2016. It found all of these issues in practice. You know, it's, it's nice to think up this law and then actually when you see it apply in practice, it, it wasn't working. The review it was called the Moss Review, it found that the experience of whistleblowers under the law was not a happy one. That was delivered in July of 2016. The law that exists on paper today is still the exact same law. Nothing has been done in six years, despite the fact that the coalition in government doubled down on prosecuting whistleblowers, raiding journalists and increasing secrecy law. So it's great we now have a government in power led led in the legal space by the Attorney General who clearly is passionate about protecting whistleblowers, but it's deeply unfortunate that he refuses to drop these two critically important cases of David McBride and Richard Boyle. And his proposed timeframe for whistleblower protection reform has been to push it down the road. This is urgent. Every day that goes by, you have potential whistleblowers in the public and private sector speaking up without the full protection of the law as it should be. And the risk is that we have more David McBrides and Richard Boyles who are on trial for telling the truth. Mm, um, And thanks to everyone who's submitting their questions. In particular, we're getting a lot of uh, personal stories of whistleblowing. And so thank you for sharing uh, those. Although uh, based on what Kieran and Sam have said, we can't be absolutely con- sure that the, those text messages are public interest disclosures in themselves, so do be careful. Uh, but um, I wanted to particularly acknowledge as well that it turns out Jacinta is indeed uh, watching, so uh, thank you. And, um, yes, we really do admire your um, whistleblowing, Jacinta, as is David McBride. So, yeah, all our best wishes and solidarity to you, David, as well. Thank you for your huge contribution to the public interest in Australia at uh, immense personal cost, we know. Um, having mentioned here and that, Uh, the urgency of the situation and the delay of the whistleblower, uh, some of the whistleblower protections that Helen Haynes had, at least in her bill. Uh, Some of the questions that have been coming in, quite a few actually, definitely from from Kevin and also uh, from Helen, has been asking about uh, the new independent uh, commission against corruption and whether it does enough to protect whistleblowers. Legislation only came out um, last week, uh, I think publicly at least, um, but I'd, I'd like to open that question up to all of our panellists. Larissa, perhaps we can hear from you. Have you have uh, the uh, the legal eagles of Get Up had a chance to look at the new um, NAC Act? They have. Um, you know, a media and democracy team have, have been writing this campaign for a long time and, and a lot of our members as well care deeply about this. The NAC is an incredible piece of legislation. Uh, You can't fault the government for that, but it needs to go further uh, and it needs something like a whistleblower um, commissioner or something within there as well. As It's not currently uh, in what's on consideration on the table. And I think it's, it's important to understand, like, we know from the conversations that we've had that Dreyfus knows this as well. He's talking about them. We know the crossbench. There are some pe- members of the crossbench, uh, people like Andrew Wilkie, who are really invested in this, who've been having this conversation for years with him as well. I think the thing we need to be is not complacent that, yep, let's just let everyone right now is giving Labor a fair go. There's a lot of things that they have to fix. We understand that, but this is urgent and it's our job as a movement to basically go out to them and say, hey, that timeline isn't good enough. There are whistleblowers on trial now and there's another one that's going to be on trial in a couple of weeks. So we need to kind of break through. I understand people are, uh, are satisfied with the type of things that they're getting done. They're a very experienced government, but we need to go further and there needs to be whistleblower protections. 
Absolutely. And yeah, it's worth mentioning on that uh, score that the Joint Select Committee Parliamentary Inquiry into the NAC legislation is on, but it'll be gone before you know it. Uh, submissions are due by Friday, hearings next week, and they're hoping to pass the legislation in November. So it's an absolutely critical time. To, uh, and there are problems uh, in the, the NAC uh, bill. Um, I, I'll go back to um, Samantha and Kieran now. We've, we, we've alluded to the problems in the the PID Act, um, and I imagine you've had a sneaky little look at the NAC Act as well. Um, feel free to tell us about your concerns about either of those things, um, and what in particular you would like to see changed. Sam, um, I, I guess I think that the the issue is um, to do with. The total coverage and then what is prosecuted so it's going to be yeah. how these protections work in practice um already in in the legislation that um kieran's been talking about there are immunity provisions for whistleblowers um so that's why it's, it's a bit baffling that these prosecutions are going ahead um and i think in some ways untested laws mean that we don't know exactly how it's going to pan out in practice but but what one of the concerns when it comes to public interest disclosures are exemptions and abilities to make prosecutions on on national security grounds on official secrecy grounds um, which are very opaque um, and broad uh, provisions that it, it's very difficult to get behind and challenge. Um, so I would like to see some, some mechanism whereby um, the person facing those charges can actually um, engage more practically with those, those types of arguments. Mm, thanks, thanks, Sam. Kieran, um, uh, what, uh, what concerns do you have about either um, the bill or the current uh, PID legislation? Give us some of your, your, your top, top qualms. Thanks, Julian. I have two, and I'll be putting these to paper tomorrow because, as you say, the submissions to the NAC inquiry close on Friday, very tight time frame, so that's my task for tomorrow. I guess I have two primary concerns. The first is that these laws are all well and good on paper, but they're not working in practice. As Sam said, actually, the law, to, to a broad extent, is pretty good, pretty robust. There are a heap of issues that we need to fix. But actually, it's, it's in practice these laws aren't working because whistleblowers don't have the support they need. We don't have, uh, in, 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 in the US, in the UK, in Ireland, in Serbia, there are civil society groups working to protect and empower whistleblowers every day. At the Human Rights Law Centre, we're trying to begin to do some of that work, but these things take time. What we see at the moment in Australia is that whistleblowers lack the practical support they need to speak up. Uh, in Helen Haynes's uh, and the Greens' Uh, uh, model uh, NAC legislation introduced in the last parliament, there was a whistleblower protection commissioner built into that model. That's an idea that time has well and truly come. It was first recommended in a 1994 Senate report. It was endorsed by a 2017 bipartisan uh, joint parliamentary inquiry. Labor took it to the 2019 election, a standalone body to protect and empower whistleblowers. That's what we need in our system. It's really disappointing that the government uh, took that out of the Helen Haynes bill, despite saying that the NAC bill would be broadly similar to the Helen Haynes model. Its current position is sort of, it's, it's open to the idea, but it's not going to commit to it. For the NAC to work, for whistleblowers to feel confident going to the NAC with concerns, we need a dedicated statutory body protecting and empowering whistleblowers. Um, my second concern is that we're effectively, you know, I totally agree with what Larissa said, that the NAC is a, a seismic piece of legislation. It's a landmark moment. But I think in some ways we're putting the cart before the horse because it doesn't address all of these whistleblower issues. So who is going to speak to the NAC? Who is going to bring concerns to the NAC? Whistleblowers. And right now we know that they're not going to be able to do that in a way that is safe and supported. So the current NAC legislation just uh, integrates into the Public Interest Disclosure Act, has a couple of provisions effectively borrowed from the Public Interest Disclosure mm. Act and doesn't have a whistleblower protection commissioner. So the NAC is a, a really important step forward, but for it to work in practice, we need better whistleblower protections and practical support for whistleblowers. And the government can do that and it must do that as soon as possible. Uh, and so much for my uh, call to action to uh, get up members to make submissions to the committee. Um, 
Uh, Larissa, I believe, in fact, Get Up members are well and truly on this case already. Is that right? Sure, there's thousands of Get Up members who have made submissions. Um, they usually flow in like that. Yes, absolutely. But I, if this is the first time you're hearing of it, there's still time. The more people that make submissions to that inquiry, you don't have to be a lawyer. We've got wonderful lawyers that are also making submissions, but regular people making submissions saying, hey, I care about this thing and I want you to do something. If you're a voter, in a lot of ways, you have as much power uh, as the two lawyers that are here today. Yeah, and a, and a short, simple submission that adds to the number of submissions overall makes a difference because when the committee says how many submissions they've got, that will be something that people uh, notice as well. But it does sound, uh, Kieran, I'm going to put a submission in as well, but it sounds like you and I might have to take a ticket because there's plenty of get-up members ahead of us in the queue. Um, uh, look, we've got a question here from David. Uh, and this is an interesting sort of flip side of this discussion. David asks, what plausible rationales do politicians or employers offer in their attempt to justify actions against uh, whistleblowers who are trying to act in the public interest? Uh, can this be a complicated picture sometimes, Sam? Um, so, yes, I mean, the, the, the arguments I most commonly see are are things about national security, um, official secrecy, that it's somehow jeopardising um, government policy or policy making or decision making, um, or otherwise putting put, putting people's lives at risk because it, it's intelligence related. But but the challenge there is that you never get any detail. Mm. Absolutely, um, and I think another thing that happens as well is that all sorts of um, performance and disciplinary issues get dragged out, a lot of mud gets thrown at people as an attempt to provide some sort of alternative rationale. So it does become a really, really tough yeah. um, gig. You sort of, your, your whole sort of work life uh, goes on trial. Well, absolutely, because, uh, I mean, it, it's interesting, people who've experienced discrimination on different grounds, protected attributes, they might have experienced that throughout their lives and be familiar with that experience. Quite often it's a different experience for a whistleblower where um, they perhaps have been one of the team, popular at work, um, perhaps a high flyer, responsible in their role. And suddenly um, the tables are turned and they're on the outside. Um, and uh, without, without knowing that this is what they were doing, they've stumbled into a dead end for their career where actually the aim is to get rid of them or to discredit them in some way so that what they're saying isn't believed. Um, and they, they are seen as the problem. Um, and so uh, apart from in, in the public interest context, public sector context, these, these kind of uh, defences and um, national security arguments in the private sector commonly it's about breach of confidentiality which can be a misconduct issue um so uh, again it's 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 basically shooting the messenger mm, absolutely uh and a lot of employers sort of go out of their way to discourage people uh, either tacitly or expressly from uh, making a public interest disclosure as opposed to some sort of other complaint. I, I uh, regret to say that I've looked at this inside the ABC and the ABC's policy documents actually try to steer people away from the Public Interest Disclosures Act, I think, because uh, of the protections that are there for whistleblowers. It's easier from a management uh, perspective to not have to deal with those protections. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure if, if the ABC is doing it, then I'm sure it's happening in the we private do, sector. We well. do commonly see that on the ground where um, complaints are treated as grievances and then dealt with by HR rather than looked at as um, a, a, an issue of public importance or yes. of major significance that justifies elevating it to broad level. And as you say, there are then these very, very severe consequences um, potentially at play, as well as challenges, because um, one of the things in, in the legislation is the ability for people to make disclosures anonymously which then require investigation. And so a lot, a lot of resource has to be put into a whistleblowing investigation. Whereas if it's regarded as a grievance and it's dealt with through HR processes, um, it, it's sort of a much easier beast for management mm. to handle. Yeah, yeah. And formal anonymity is one thing, but, uh, you know, word does tend to travel around workplaces um, and people can get, can be the subject, can have things that are reprisals happen to them without it being, you know, um, obvious on uh, the face of it. Uh, I, I'll come back to you, Kieran, because there's another question 
hear from uh, Peter. Uh, we've heard about the Caleri case being dropped. Obviously, that's a very welcome and important decision by the Attorney General. But, but Peter asks, why won't the current government drop the cases against um, David McBride and Richard Boyle if they did drop the case against Bernard Caleri? Uh, that's the million dollar question. So the government uh, used a power under the Judiciary Act to intervene and discontinue the case against Bernard Caleri. That was a historic moment and it had never happened before in Australian history. The Human Rights Law Centre and I know GetUp have been calling on uh, the government to do the same in relation to Richard Boyle and Dave McBride. We say these cases are all exceptional. They all have a chilling effect. They all undermine Australian democracy. Um, the government has said that uh, it disagrees, it doesn't think these are exceptional cases and it doesn't think it should intervene. That's really disappointing. These cases are very similar to, 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 to Bernard in terms of its the democratic significance and it's hugely problematic that these two individuals are on trial for seeking to tell the truth and having to rely on a, a faulty shield, a shield that uh, the government has recognised is broken. So that's disappointing. Um, the one perhaps ray of, of light, uh, the uh, Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions uh, and the Attorney General, they both have the power to drop these prosecutions. There, there'll surely be a new Director of Public Prosecutions appointed as the old one was elevated to the Supreme Court. So uh, I'm, I'm sure that um, groups like ours will, will be calling on the new uh, Director of Public Prosecutions to exercise their power to revisit the public interest or, or very much lack thereof in these two cases. So Look, really disappointing, but I also I don't want to sort of end on, on a um, negative note. There is also a lot of sort of optimism in this space. The the win uh, when the Bernard Cleary case was dropped was a huge win for Australian democracy, and it was thanks to incredible work by so many people who gathered in front of the court, who wrote to the Attorney General, who were in the media. So I think there's a lot of bright sort of sparks here as well, um, but unfortunately still so so much to go. Uh, for those on the session who are asking how they can make a submission to the NAC inquiry, uh, GetUp is on the case and you just go to the GetUp website, getup.org.au slash NAC, N-A-C-C, uh, uh, dash submission, and they'll show you how to get to the uh, Parliament side. I'm very confident that the GetUp side is a hell of a lot more user-friendly than the Parliament <laughs> House uh, website, having a, had a look at uh, both of them. Um, it is a, it's an interesting sort of mixed time, as we've said, because, you know, there there, um, there is some really positive legislation on the table, but um, we've had some questions in uh, from Deb, Linda, George, also um, asking, given what we've heard tonight about the urgency of these issues, uh, what is it that has caused the, uh, the Attorney General and the government to put whistleblowing reform uh, down the track a little bit? You know, some of the questions are, is the government stalling? Is it politics? Um, uh, Larissa, any thoughts on, on what it is or, or, or is it? But this is just a really hard area and they've got a lot on their plate. Yeah, but that's not a good enough excuse not to get it done. So they've got a lot on their plate. There's a lot of things that are priorities and a lot of those things require a lot of time, a lot of legislation changes. Um, I think that the reality is I think ICAC and the NAC and those types of campaigns are probably more prolific in terms of people talking about them and we're talking about usually when we're talking about ICACs and that sort of stuff we're talking about governments doing the wrong thing and people understand like there should be a corruption commission and those types of stuff I don't think people understand that you don't automatically get whistleblower protection in those types of things so we need to really you know this is why we've created this film to share this film uh and when we share it and as uh we are going into the um, you know, the inquiries and those types of things, this will be in the media more. It's it's regular people, the people that are watching this right now and the people who, your friends who you share this with, um, to sh to tell them that they they can drop the criminal prosecutions of Richard Boyle and David McBride right now, that we need civil protection as part of the NAC, um, that we need to reform public interest disclosure and we need to reform the Corporations Act. And if they don't know why we need to do those things, they need to watch this film. This is why we've created this film, to help you explain to people why it's so important for us to beat the, the, the drum and, and create this demand because governments don't do anything unless we tell them they have to. Uh, we're the voters uh, and we're the ones who, who should decide what is in our public interest. 
Absolutely. And uh, Kieran's comments about the, the new Commonwealth uh, Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, very apposite there as well. I speak as somebody who has had criminal charges dropped thanks to the intervention of an independent uh, public prosecutor uh, back in the days of APEC. The police wanted to run the prosecution, but it was Nick Cowdery as the Director of Public Prosecutions who dropped the charges against, against us. So I interviewed him some years later and asked him why, and he effectively argued himself out of the decision uh, in response to the question. So I won't be asking those questions again, but it is very important uh, that we have independent statutes office holders like uh, the Commonwealth DPP and uh, hopefully uh, that will be a, a source of some uh, beneficial exercising of those sorts of discretions. Now look we've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, thanks again to everyone who's put in what's really just a fantastic set of uh, very probing questions. Uh, I might uh, finish up with this question which is coming from Oliver and I'll open up to everyone on the panel because Oliver's asking well, what specific whistleblower legislation, whistleblower protection ideas would be the ones that we should be pushing for at this moment where potentially some changes to the legislation are on the table? What are the big things we need to see or that you'd like to see? I know we've heard some of that already from um, our speakers uh, already, but um, but let's go round the round the traps one more time to say if a uh, you know if a get up members thinking yeah I am actually going to put in a, a submission and I'm going to get it in before Julian and Kieran, what should they be focusing on? Um, Sam, what would you say? Um, well, I've talked a bit about the, the category of um, eligible recipients. I think mm. that could be done away with entirely. Mm. Um, if there has to be something in its place, a colleague should be sufficient. And then the focus would then be whether the retaliation was caused by um, disclosing this information rather than this, this narrow cohort of people. I, I fully endorse what, what Kieran said about a central regulatory oversight and enforcement body, um, you know, perhaps with the powers to investigate um, off its own bat, um, as well as intervene and make policy statements. But one thing that I think would be significant for shifting the culture on these areas away from this um, shooting the messenger approach is actually to celebrate what whistleblowers do for us, because we all stand to benefit. And so um, rather than um, sort of attacking them and penalising them, um, what about a system for rewards? Um, it's, it's controversial that in, in the US, there are potentially very, very, very significant financial rewards for whistleblowers. Um, and apart from that, there are other ways of celebrating the bravery of whistleblowers who stick their neck out for the benefit of all of us. Um, we can recognise them in civil society, they can be given honours, they can be, um, you know, celebrated in Parliament, they can feature in public, um, public awareness campaigns about um, the rights and protections for whistleblowers once we've sorted out some of the problems with, with the legislation as well. Mm, yeah. um, you know, ultimately, we want people to stand up and speak up when they see wrongdoing. Absolutely, and they, they can and should be celebrated in the workplace as well. Um, you know, organisations that that have that sort of open discussion and allow dissent are more likely to correct themselves than to find themselves having to be corrected by um, the sort of, uh, you know, sort of institutional trauma that can happen if there is, uh, you know, a well-founded whistle blown against any organisation. Thanks very much, Sam. That's uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. Um, Kieran, some final thoughts from you? I think the bottom line here is that whistleblowers make Australia a better place and so we need to do more at every level to ensure they are protected and empowered and not punished. If we think about some of the seismic scandals that have led to really significant change in Australia, so many of them have come because brave Australians have spoken up and we've got to be doing all we can to ensure that they can continue to do that. Uh, I, I think um, Australia once led the world in this area. Uh, whistleblowing law introduced in Queensland and South Australia in the early 90s put Australia with only the US as having standalone laws for whistleblowers. We've since fallen behind. The creation of a whistleblower protection commissioner or authority, a standalone statutory body, would again see Australia leading the world, innovating, joining countries like the Netherlands and the US as some of the only countries with uh, really robust regulatory oversight agencies for whistleblowing and whistleblower protections. That's what we have to do. Uh, to me, that's num number one priority. We have to create a body that can protect and empower whistleblowers. 
Thanks very much, Kieran. And I'll come back to you, uh, Larissa, for a final word. And in particular, uh, I think we know that this film, everyone's seen it now, but it's going to be in people's inboxes uh, tomorrow morning. What should they do once it hits those inboxes? Yeah, wonderful uh, media and democracy team. The links that will be, so we'll post this all across our social media. If you're a GetUp member, you will receive this. Some people don't know that they're GetUp members until they receive our emails and, um, oh, like, oh, that's the, the campaigns that we've donated to. But there is a really simple explainer in there around how, uh, what the types of things we can change and how to make a submission. It's a really easy process um, that the campaigners have stepped out for you. Just want to like underscore that the whistleblowers have been the bedrock of so many get up campaigns. Um, the ability to evacuate Minnesota and, and Nauru and the Medivac legislation, you know, our bil- ability to mobilize uh, and stand up behind whistleblowers. And that's what this is about now. And I also want to say, like, all the submissions that we've made, um, there are wonderful lawyers that are going to make submissions that understand the legislation, that understand. Uh, exactly what those things need to look like, but it is really powerful to tell politicians what is the value of whistleblower protection to you. Um, those are the types of things uh, that really get people and and to reach out to your, you know, the your local MPs, um, to the senators and say, these are why I care about them. The more genuine responses that they get, the more they um, they kind of see that, yes, this is something that people care about. And that's it. that's our role as civil society. Thanks very much, uh, Larissa. And, uh, yeah, look, thanks to everyone who's been a part of making the film, The Cost, Whistleblowers in Australia. Do share the film when it hits your inbox tomorrow. Get it out on social media. Get in contact with the Attorney General's office. And and I'm not sure how, I don't know if there's a message board on the Commonwealth DPP, there probably isn't, but definitely get the Attorney General uh, aware of the fact, uh, not only that uh, there are problems in the existing PID Act, but that also that there could be beneficial improvements to the NAC Act as well. I'll be certainly making my submission. Uh, as far as I can tell, under the NAC Act, astoundingly, um, uh, anything that's that's sort of categorised as parliamentary business is excluded. Uh, and I don't think parliamentary privilege should extend to corruption. Just a, just a personal view, but um, uh, that's also a problem in the legislation. But it's great to know that GetUp is ramping up, and when GetUp ramps up, it's a substantial force in civil society and major changes uh, have occurred and hopefully will continue to occur on this very point very soon too. So thanks to everyone for participating. Again, I just want to acknowledge the whistleblowers um, who are on the, the call and the session today uh all the best to 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 all of you particularly um uh, david of course and and um uh jacinta and sharon we really do uh uh respect and admire your efforts and we wish you all all the very best keep fighting the the good fight um thank you very much to you for tuning in um and uh yeah look out in your inboxes for the film and spread the word far and wide and hopefully we can get better protections for whistleblowers in this country i'm julian morrow good night Thanks, Julian. Thanks, everyone. I thought that was a good discussion and um, great questions from the audience. So I sort of integrated them a little bit earlier because I thought that would be um, appreciated by the audience. I hope that was all right. Julian, you were a pro, an absolute pro. (laughs) An actual pro.